Thanks for listening to the Film Florida podcast. If you have a minute, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Thanks, and we appreciate your support. Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. My name is John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Today, our guest is Matt Wool. Matt is both a filmmaker and an educator, as well as being on an executive board member for Film Florida. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Matt. Thank you for speaking with me. So what's your backstory? How did you get your start in the industry? I got my start in the industry kind of at an early age. I grew up in Vermont, and there was a film called Sweetheart's Dance, which was coming to Vermont. And uh, it was most notable for having Don Johnson in it, who was at the time in Miami Vice, which actually ironically is a Florida connection. And they were casting some of the parts locally. And it was a month-long process with multiple auditions, and I didn't go to a single one. And then they called me down. I was literally in the class at high school, and they called me down to the office. I, all my friends thought I'd done something to get in trouble. And it turns out I was one of 10 people selected to go in for a special casting because they hadn't found what they wanted. Uh, so then I met with the casting director. They flew the tape to the director. And I got the largest locally cast uh, part. They put me in SAG, and I uh, was able to pay for a chunk of my college. So that was when I thought, this is pretty cool. And uh, I got to work with uh, Susan Sarandon, Jeff Daniels, Don Johnson, Elizabeth Perkin, Justin Henry. Uh, It was really a, a pretty great experience. And the whole time I was on set, I asked, where should I go to school? Where should I go to film school? I'd already done theater, but I was like, I'm done with theater. I'm going to do film now. And I kept asking where I should go to film school and sort of reverberating through was everybody saying, don't go to film school, get a real degree. You'll always have that to fall back on. So uh, I ended up getting a degree in politics. So did you ever find out what exactly the reasoning was for wanting you or bringing you down? Well, it's interesting because uh, sort of at the time, I don't now, but at the time I had very bright red hair. And uh, so everybody sort of thought, well, they just wanted the redhead, redheaded kid. And um, the casting director actually ended up working, uh, or the casting assistant, I guess it was, ended up working on set as well. And I said, did you, know, did you guys, were you looking for a redheaded kid? And they said, no, it was the opposite. You almost didn't get the part because everyone was worried that your red hair was going to stand out too much. They just liked what you did. And I said, okay. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the only insight I have. But it was, an, it was an amazing experience. And in a way, it was film school. I just, I sat on set, you know, just, I just absorbed every single thing that I could. And, um, you know, literally getting to be on, on screen with, you know, some very, very accomplished actors. Um, and, and Tak Fujimoto was the, was the DP. I was incredibly impressed watching him. Um, Robert Greenwald was the director. He was amazing. It was just, it was, I just, you know, was a kid in the candy store. I know your recent career, your current career, includes both filmmaking and educating, but before that time, you were involved in a number of different aspects in the industry. Tell us about that. So, I guess it's probably best then to begin after I graduated college and uh, I was going to move to Seattle and realized I didn't have enough money to move to Seattle, but I probably could afford to move to Orlando. So I did. And then I started to perform at SAC Theater, which is a pretty well-known improv theater. And that's where I started to really get into storytelling. I love performing on stage, but I also realized that I really loved creating story. And that's what drove me to start writing for screen. So it was while I was living in Orlando that I wrote my first screenplay, which was not great. Uh, I actually recently went back and reread it. It was okay. It was better than I sort of gave it credit for, but it was not great. But that started me on that that journey. And I, that was when I sort of doubled down and said, oh, right, I really do love this thing. And then I moved out to Los Angeles where I worked on a couple of industrials and uh, shot and directed and wrote and produced a, uh, a short film that actually it was my first time working with a budget. 
and that was great. And then that film ended up going into the Vermont International Film Festival and people liked that. And then they did a, a, a actual sort of featurette on me as a filmmaker. And then they sort of went, oh, I guess this is what I'm doing now. And from there, I moved back to Vermont, actually. And it was – Vermont doesn't have a large film community, so I really started focusing on my writing. I also was a, was a field producer for a television station. Uh, I worked on a public access TV show. I was making short films with friends, but there just wasn't as much happening there. So I really focused on my writing. I wrote a few more screenplays, went to grad school to study screenwriting. Through that, I ended up getting – Several of my screenplays optioned by Crane Media, which is a company out in California, headed by Jonathan Crane. He's most known for working with John Travolta on a bunch of films. He's produced 47 in all, but he, he produced like Swordfish and Face Off and Phenomenon and Look Who's Talking and uh, Michael and a bunch of other, other films that John Travolta did. And so uh, he ended up optioning two, two of my scripts. And then uh, from there, I was just, I was going. And as I mentioned, you're now involved in education. So tell us about that. Yeah, so the, the education piece sort of, uh, I realized some, at some point looking back that almost every job I've had has, has had an educational component. When I was younger, I worked at summer camps and would like teach kids soccer. And then when I worked at Disney, I ended up being, becoming a trainer there. And I realized I just, whatever I've done, I've always loved to share whatever I've learned. And so once I got my graduate degree, I realized that I really wanted to be able to do some teaching. And so, uh, again, at this time, I was living in Vermont. And so I started to teach at uh, Burlington College in Vermont. And then I ended up becoming the, the chair of the department, which was, I mean, it was a great little department, but it was a little department. Uh, there were two of us who were full-time, and then we had about five or six other adjuncts. But it was a really nice little program, and, and even though it's a small school, the, the, the film department made up about um, – 30% of the student body. Wow. So we, we were a small but mighty program there, and we had really great equipment, and the, the community actually supported us in a, in a great way. So um, that, that was, a, that was a, a great experience. And you're still involved in education, right? I am. So then what, what brought me back to Florida was, um, so having lived in, in uh, Florida and out in California for a while, I realized I really don't like cold weather, John. And so I, I started to look for opportunities in warmer places, specifically Florida. And there was uh, an opening for the chair of the School of Entertainment and Design Technology at Miami Dade College. And so uh, I moved down here and uh, for that job and did that for, for several years. And just being in Florida, it's actually amazing. This is going to sound like an ad for Florida, but just being here, I, I started to, to immediately have uh, interest in, in my work again and start to meet really creative and great people I wanted to work with. And so I left being chair of, of the program after two years so that I could work more on my own things because that was starting to take more time. And I still do teach. I teach now at Broward College. I think I'll always teach. I, I love that. I love sharing my experiences as much as it's helpful with students. So I, I, I still teach at Broward College, and I still love that, but I'm also able to, to focus on my own work as well. And I know you're also, uh, speaking of your own work, a very active filmmaker. And while a lot of people like to say they're a filmmaker, and I'm using air quotes to say that. You actually make films. So tell us about that part of your career. The beauty of being here is that I finally had the support, was able to get a team uh, of people fairly easily to create work. Not that that couldn't happen in Vermont, and it didn't happen in Vermont, but it, it was just easier to do here. So uh, last in 2018, in uh, May, I shot a short film and actually, you know, did it through SAG and it had a little bit bigger budget and really got some great talent and it's proof of concept for um, a television series or a feature. It actually can kind of go one of two ways, but um, I, I was sort of tired of just being the guy who talks about doing things. I just, I never want to be that guy. So every time I'm close 
to catching myself to being that guy. I go, oh, I'm talking about doing things. It really must be time for me to do something again. So that was the product was the short film called Mom. Then later in the summer, and and this is kind of kind of a crazy story because it just doesn't happen this way. Uh, but I had been hired by a director down here to write a uh, a feature, and he was he still is looking for funding for it. And last summer, I got hit up on Instagram. Somebody pinged me and said, you don't know me, but I've read some of your work. I want to finance one of your films. This isn't a joke. So immediately I thought, okay, this is a joke. Right. But I always tell my students, and I've also lived by this, that you need to treat everything as real or nothing will ever be real. And so that certainly led me down some holes. I've worked with some funders who who never came to be. I've worked with some producers that – haven't panned out, but it's also worked out for me, and I've, I've found some lasting partnerships through that. And three weeks after that Instagram ping, I had full funding for my micro-budget feature. Wow. So uh, that was shot in September. So we shot a feature in September. I brought back some of the team from the short film, which was the other objective of shooting a f- short film. And I recommend this to people. Find a team, build a team, Creating a short film is a great way to find out if you want to work with someone again. And it's also a, a, a lower risk way of finding if you want to work out with, with people again. So I really recommend to people who are trying to be working filmmakers to do that. Go create something, make a short film, find the people you want to work with, and keep working with them. And so I brought back some of the people from my short film, and then there were a couple of people who had schedule conflicts from the short film that I that couldn't work on it, so I brought them in on the feature. Uh, notably, Pejman Jatala. Pej is the chair of the Broward College Film Program, and he and I have just been friends for for a couple of years now, and uh, really in, in sort of enjoy each other, have great conversations, and I, we kept sort of saying we have to have something to work on, and so when I when it came to my feature, I, he was one of the, the first pieces I put in place was to to get him involved. And now you had an opportunity to go over to London recently through your filmmaking, right? I did, yeah. So that's the other thing. So last year, and um, Miami Media Film Market had a competition, a pitch competition that coincided with Film London. And Film London were actually sort of the ones just picking the winners, but it was f- through the Miami Media Film Market. And they were looking for um, five ideas for television shows that had some component that could be shot in London. And I had been working with, uh, with my friend Danny to come up with an idea for a show. We were trying to find a project that we could work on, and it just happened that this, like, this sort of weird, quirky idea really sort of fit in the parameters of what they were looking for. Um, it was kind of odd, so when I, when I heard about the competition, I said, well, that's weird. Like usually these sort of targeted things – you're trying to really bend an idea to what they're looking for. But in this case, I was lucky enough to have an idea sort of in the hopper that was very, very close to what they were looking for, and I was fortunate enough to win. And uh, sort of actually it was right around uh, Thanksgiving time, went to London for a week. And that was amazing, going to, uh, meeting the people at Film London and seeing how film is done in the UK was eye-opening and, and actually sort of changed my thinking about how I'll, I'll do film here. In what way? Well, I think there, there's sort of several things. The, the first was there was a lack of ego that I think we all could really learn from. It was really just a bunch of people doing their jobs, and they took it very seriously. Every, everybody I met, no matter where, where they were, who they were, they were all just very serious about the work and very as a, a sort of a matter of fact about the work. I think that we can, uh, in some ways create drama around our drama. <laughs> and uh, I know I've, I've certainly done that at times in my life, and it doesn't serve any purpose at all. So that was, was one part. And then I think also just the attention to detail on every aspect of shows and, and sort of, you know, the, just the, the way they are able to maximize what they can do. I mean, London is one city, but so much work is now happening there because they've really found ways to 
leverage what they have to the greatest potential. And that's something I've always tried to do in my career. So it's sort of like they were doing on, you know, on a level of a city saying, okay, London can be all of this. And, you know, like I, I wasn't aware, I probably should have been, but Isle of Dogs was actually all done on a studio in, in London. And sort of they, they just find ways to create work. And part of that, um, you know, and John, you and I have talked about incentives before, but part of that is the incentive uh, in the UK and specifically London. They've done a pretty brilliant job of, of creating an incentive that works and, and keeps bringing work in. And that's not enough, though. So that's what I love is the pairing of, a, of an incentive program that's great with a very, very large pool of incredibly talented people who are all in it to accomplish great work. And then the outcome is what you see on BBC and all those, you know, sort of uh, outlets, but also sort of a lot of major films and television shows just are being shot there that not even originated from the UK. That sounds excellent. And as we've talked about, that's pretty much exactly what we're trying to accomplish here in Florida. And Matt, with all the things you're involved in, including being on the executive board for Film Florida, talk about the balancing act. Well, uh, it's ironic that you're talking about the balancing act um, 15 minutes after I uh, almost missed recording this podcast, John. So, um, so sometimes I balance better than others, quite, quite frankly. Uh, I think that it's tough. The balancing act is always tough and you have to learn to let things go and not beat yourself up about it. And I think that was one of the sort of the lessons for me is, really allowing myself to not do things uh, because there, there was a time where I sort of prided myself on sort of saying, if something comes my way, I'm going to be yes. I was almost like, you know, Jim Carrey and yes man saying like yes to everything. And, I, and there that had benefit at that time in my life. Like there was definitely no doubt that I gained from that sort of mentality. Now it's a different place. Now I have to, I can't do everything that comes across my desk. And so I just try to, to, to examine everything that's coming my way and I don't sort of, you know, Marie Kondo it and see if it brings me joy. But in a way, I guess I do now that I think about it. Yeah, I guess I kind of do. I, you know, I, I've made choices not always for sort of the money side of it. I've made more choices about is this someone I want to work with? Is this the kind of project I want to be doing? Is it going to sort of, you know, is step A going to bring me to step B, which is something that's more close to me? I sort of look at all those things, and it is tough. You know, it, it's, there's not a downtime. There's no sort of off-season when I sort of do things like this because, you know, I'm already sort of trying to think about what I'm going to be doing this summer when I'm not teaching. So it's sort of like once one space fills up, I tend to try to fill it with something else. So what's next for you? That is a great question. So I'm wrapping up several things. And so, you know, the, the short film I mentioned is uh, I'm getting ready to put that out to festivals. Um, that actually got delayed somewhat because of the feature. So um, I really wanted to, to have the short film done sooner. But again, when full funding comes your way for a feature, the short kind of takes a back seat. So I'm back to that place of working on that. And it's all, it's all cut. We just have to do some color correction and then uh, get it out. So it's really, really close to, to being out the door. But the feature we have distribution on, we're working with a company called Artist Rights Distribution. Um, Patrick there has been amazing, and we will be doing limited theatrical as well as digital distribution. So I'm currently in the middle of gathering all of the assets for digital and theatrical presentation, and that is a not as small a task as one might think. <laughs> it's, it's actually slightly daunting. So I'll be spending almost the next month just putting together all the assets and making sure that we have everything that we need for that. Then in June, we will have a limited theatrical run, which is great, which is also part of the reason why we went with this distributor was that that was one of the things they were bringing to the table is a limited theatrical run. We're probably going to be in uh, 12 to 15 cities at this point. We will uh, have premieres in Miami and Orlando. Uh, it was a very, very Florida production. I, I flew in one person from, from out of state, uh, and I'm sorry, two people from out of state. Everybody else, cast and crew, was from Florida. And it was actually a pretty even mix. It was maybe 
60, 40, 60 Miami, 40 Orlando. When I was in Orlando, I was the producer of the Orlando Fringe Festival for four years and have a lot of contacts there. And um, I worked with Beth Marshall, who's an amazing casting director out of Orlando. And about half of my cast came from Orlando, and then the other half came from Miami. So we'll do an Orlando and a Miami premiere. And I'm sure you're going to let us know when all that stuff is, and we'll be able to get that out to our audience as well, right? Absolutely. We're, we're, we're figuring out the dates. And it's one of those things, too, you sort of think movie release, oh, we're just going to do a release. We're going to do a staged release for, for several reasons. And sort of I hope maybe this part, if anyone out there is you know, interested in distributorship, they should they should, um, you know, feel free to hit me up. But this is something that I learned. This is a small production, right? This is not a, a bigger film. And it, we're going to do a stage theatrical release. And what I mean by that is that we're actually going to be in theaters for about three months because we're going to go from one city to the next, to the next, to the next. And we'll be in two or three at a time, but we'll sort of spread it out. And And there's two reasons for that. One if you go into 15 cities, that means you have to have 15 DCPs, which are the, the actual hard drive that goes to each theater. So the cost goes way up if just by having to have 15 DCPs instead of two or three, which we could do. But the other thing that we gain and maybe even more beneficial is that by stretching it out over two to three months, when you go to Amazon Prime or iTunes, some of these platforms digitally – have a section for films that are still in theaters. So when you look at the still in theaters section for renting videos, ours will pop up there. So we sort of immediately get above some of the clutter of just new releases to the digital platform and enter a more exclusive space of films that are in theaters but available to rent now. So you're, ex you're extending the timeliness of it. Yes. Yep, exactly. So we're, we're sort of we're getting the maximum benefit from that as well. And the other thing that you gain from, from theatrical is that we will get reviews. Uh, we will be on Box Office Mojo. So our little film is going to, to play bigger than it is in some ways. And hopefully we'll get traction. And then, you know, maybe we'll go even to more cities. We'll, 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 you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. It sounds like you have a lot going on, Matt, which is great to hear. That's it for this episode of the Film Florida Podcast. Thanks to Matt Wool for joining us, and thank you for listening. To learn more about Matt, visit TravelingDogFilms.com. That's TravelingDogFilms.com. For more information about Film Florida, go to FilmFlorida.org, or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. 